Tonight, very supportive. the president-elect's pick for U.S. Attorney General takes his name out of the running. What comes next for the Trump transition? And Israel at war. Why an international warrant has been issued for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. About face, a top Trump pick officially bows out. Good evening and welcome to Faith Nation. I'm Jenna Browder. From the CBN studio in the nation's capital, I'm John Jessup. Well, one day after trying to win support among GOP senators at the U.S. Capitol, Matt Gates has withdrawn as the nominee to lead the Department of Justice. A, a former Florida congressman, he abruptly, uh, abruptly made the decision earlier today, posting this on X. While momentum was strong, it is clear that my confirmation was unfairly becoming a distraction to the critical work of the trump vance transition. There is no time to waste on a needlessly protracted Washington scuffle. Gates adding, Trump's DOJ must be in place and ready on day one. The decision is a setback for President-elect Trump, who had publicly backed Gates despite growing doubt over the nomination due to ongoing questions related to investigations by the Justice Department and House Ethics Committee over alleged sexual misconduct with a 17-year-old. Gates has maintained his innocence while the DOJ did not bring charges. Yesterday, the Ethics Committee deadlocked and refused to publish its report. That report was cut short when Gates resigned from Congress after Trump tapped him to serve as Attorney General. Well, let's bring in CBN Chief Political Analyst David Brody. So yesterday, David, Matt Gates was up on Capitol Hill with Senator and President-elect J.D. Vance to garner support for his nomination. Does this come as a surprise? No, the timing comes a bit of a surprise. I mean, I think this was eventually on its way to happening, uh, but it happened much more qu quickly than anybody expected. And, and look, that's because, look, I've been around this town, so to speak, for a long time. Like I like to say, since the Civil War, it feels like. And the way it works is senators have a heart to heart meeting with Matt Gates and they say, uh, Matt, here's the deal it ain't happening just so you know. And they're going to say it in a bless your heart way. They may be blunt about it, but it'll be cordial, like senatorial. But that's what they're telling him. And he knew the writing was on the wall. And that was it. Look, this is this has been a colossal disaster uh, from the get go. Uh, and it, it just it, it's a hiccup right now for Trump. I think ultimately, you know, they'll move past this, but it's it's not good optics at all. Yeah. So with Gates out now, David, are there any other names that you're hearing or um, yeah, yeah, who, possibilities for the attorney general? Yeah, well, Todd Blanche has been nominated uh, to be deputy attorney general. He may just get the nod to be attorney general. You say, who's Todd Blanche? He's the guy. Not that you're saying that, Jenna, by the way. Uh, but uh, Todd Blanche uh, represented Donald Trump in, his, uh, in that trial in New York. Uh, so he could get the nod. Uh, Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey, as well, is kind of on that list. Uh, also, Mike Lee, Senator Mike Lee, that might prove potentially problematic to replace him in Utah. They'll probably get a Republican senator, but will that person be a Mike Lee type of senator? And then watch out for a dark horse here. And it wouldn't surprise me if you see someone like Ken Paxson, the attorney general of Texas, very controversial. Conservatives love him. Uh, he's been a loyalist with Trump. Uh, that could be the shakeup pick. Again, a double shakeup here, guys. You know, the Trump team says Gates gave them a little bit of forewarning about his withdrawal. You, you're familiar with uh, Donald Trump. How do you think he reacted to the news? Well, I don't think it's going to be so much on Gates, quite frankly. I think this is going to be more he's frustrated with the vetting process here. You know, like what in the world? Uh, how did how did uh, this uh, this kind of even come to it? They, they knew that the, the, the report was out there, clearly. They knew some of the allegations were out there as well. The DOJ declined to prosecute. However, my sources are telling me tonight that there's going to be a lot more coming out on this in the next 24 to 48 hours, possibly uh, into early next week. And it is bad, is what they say, like really bad, like stuff mm. we haven't heard yet. And I think that's the dot, dot, dot to this story. So in answer to your question, John, I think ultimately Trump and others in his orbit now know what the dot, dot, dot to the story is. And so does Gates. And that's the end of Matt Gates' uh, run for attorney general. It lasted 0 0.25 seconds. <laughs> yeah. You know, David, the question now, what, is, what does this mean for some of the other more controversial picks 
Uh, Pete Hegseth is in the news a lot, Tulsi mm -hmm. Gabbard, RFK Jr. What, is, what does this mean for them? Well, a lot of folks inside Trump world are frustrated at Matt Gates for saying, look, why don't you just stick it out? Just stick it out so you can take some of the uh, spotlight off of some of these other nominees that might be a bit con controversial. He did, obviously didn't do that. But Pete Hegseth, I think, is, quote, the next man up in terms of uh, coming under some serious scrutiny. Uh, after that, uh, RFK obviously will have the scrutiny, so will Tulsi Gabbard. Having said that, I think Pete Hegseth is the next one to kind of make the news cycle, as we like to say. And when you say make the news cycle, do you think he's going to bow out like um, like Gates, or do you think he might be able to actually make his way through the Senate confirmation? No, I don't think it'll be a bow out right now, at least. Uh, but I think there's going to be a lot of pressure. As The, the problem with the Hegseth situation is that uh, during the vetting process, you know, n they didn't quite know about this latest 2000, I think it's 17 or 18 allegation of mm. sexual assault against him that, that he, you know, he, he, he paid, uh, he paid someone and, and that was that. Right. The point is, yeah, it, it, that's, that's the problem. I caught the Trump world blindsided. Yep. Certainly yeah. seemed to catch them by surprise. CBN's yep. David Brody. Thanks so much, David. Well, as the next administration prepares to take office, questions remain about the fate of the popular social media platform TikTok. The app is owned by Chinese-based company ByteDance. Earlier this year, President Biden signed a law requiring TikTok to change owners by January or face a ban in the United States due to what was based on security uh, concerns. With that deadline looming and the dawn of a new administration, the app's future is uncertain. Back in 2020, then-President Trump tried to ban TikTok through a failed executive order, but on the 2024 campaign trail, he vowed to make sure it stays around. Well, Virginia Senator Mark Warner is the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee and an outspoken critic on the dangers of TikTok. Earlier today, I spoke with him about the app and what national security might look like under the new Trump administration. Senator Warner, welcome to you. So earlier this year, you and President-elect Trump's choice for Secretary of State, Senator Marco Rubio, worked together to warn that TikTok is a threat to our national security. Since then, Congress passed a law to ban the popular app if it's not sold to a non-Chinese owner by January. I'm, I'm wondering, has TikTok done anything to alleviate those concerns that you uh, and Senator Rubio brought forth? Well, John, let's, we gotta look back on this. As, as you may know, the person who first educated me on this issue was President Trump during his first term. He raised the concern. His then Secretary of Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, helped convince me um, of the challenge. And I know there's a lot of creativity on TikTok. And, and at the end of the day, you know, we're not saying it has to be banned, but it ought to be owned by some entity that's not controlled by the Communist Party of China. So uh, the reasons are twofold. One because TikTok repeatedly has shown that it uh, has, can uh, you know, keep American data, uh, personal data about users. And two, um, you, there is no more powerful propaganda tool than TikTok. About 40% of young people between 18 and 24 get all their news from TikTok. And one of the geniuses about TikTok is, you know, it kind of knows what you like before you know. So if the Communist Party says, well, let's put something that's anti-religious, let's put something in that is, uh, you know, against Taiwan or pro-Russia, they can build that into the algorithm. So they've done nothing um, to change my view. And I just hope that President Trump, who was, again, was the leader on this, uh, doesn't get convinced by some of his wealthy donors uh, to kind of change his position. Well, along those lines, President-elect Trump has signaled that he might not enforce that ban. Uh, are you worried about that? And then secondly, does he even have the power to stop the law from going into effect? Well, this was a law, John, that was passed by 80% of the House and 80% of the Senate. Tremendously bipartisan. Now there was Israel aid and Ukraine aid, so it was all rolled in. I don't know how uh, any president can arbitrarily stop a law that is passed. He could try to uh, he could try to revoke the law or try to get Congress to overturn it. Um, but I, I don't know how you just ignore it. And and you know there is a, a extra I believe 90 days. So it's if it's not done by January, I think the president can kick it out till about April. Um, but I I hope that we we see this this entity sold. 
Shifting gears here a little bit, the United States is facing a rise in anti-Semitism, uh, some stemming from extreme online discourse. A, a recent report from the Anti-Defamation League outlines millions of instances of hateful content, including anti-Semitism and white supremacy on a popular gaming platform called Stream. Since that report, you've written a letter to its parent company. W what's your message? My message is this. You know, Americans got a First Amendment right uh, to say crazy things if they want, but there are that this gaming platform's own rules of conduct says you, 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 you can't be extreme. And the notion that you've got this white supremacist Nazi um, uh, imagery at a really high level, I've said, uh, come on, guys, what are you doing to self police? Um, you've got rules of conduct that gamers are supposed to uh, adhere to if you go on this platform. You ought to in, in, enforce your, your rules of contact. And I am extraordinarily concerned about the rise of anti-Semitism. You know, we mentioned Marco Rubio, Donald Trump's Secretary of State nominee. As the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and as you're watching how the president-elect is building out his national security team, I, I wonder uh, what, what crosses your mind? What concerns do you have? Well, listen, I think um, Marco Rubio, I've worked with for over a decade on the Intel Committee. We don't agree on everything by any means, but I think he's a serious, responsible figure. I think he will represent the president-elect and America well. I look forward to supporting him. Um, the person that the, the, the president has picked uh, for his national security advisor, Mike Waltz, the former um, Florida congressman, I don't know him as well, but my interactions with him indicate I think he's a serious guy. I've got some real concerns about some of the other picks. Um, you know, I owe the president the fact that I'm going to give every one of his nominees. I was a former governor. I, as a chief executive, I expected my legislature to give me the benefit of the doubt. But in these national security positions, um, we've got to do a thorough vetting. We've got to ask tough questions. The reasons why we're talking about President-elect Trump's nominees is because of the 2024 election, which delivered a big blow to the Democratic Party. Why do you think that was, and how does the party recalibrate? Well, I've been a big believer that the party needs to move more to the middle. I've been a big believer that, you know, and, and I acknowledge that the Democrats in a lot of places have got a brand that's not very popular. And matter of fact, I think certain people don't even hear our policy positions if, if you, uh, um, if, if it comes from a Democrat. I've been a, a big advocate when I first ran for governor, for example. I sponsored a NASCAR truck. I, I you know, had a bluegrass song. I, had, I think you need to show respect for people's culture. Um, I heard that the one interview said, some voters said, you know, how do you, one word for the Republicans, they said crazy, one word for the Democrats were preachy. Uh, and, it, and, and looking down, I think Democrats have got to respect people that have different views. Um, at the same time, I, I do think uh, there is, you know, there's going to be a clear contrast now. Um, you know, I wish the president elect well, but they've got control of all the le levers of power going forward. And um, my job as part of the loyal opposition is to work with them where I can. But if there's differences, to point out those differences. And, and there won't be an ability for the president elect to blame everything uh, simply on the Democrats. Senator Mark Warner from the Commonwealth of Virginia, we appreciate your time. Thanks so much tonight. Thank you, John. All right, a shocking departure from 15 years of national security precedent. That's how the Democratic chair of the Senate Homeland Security Committee is characterizing a move from Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas and FBI Director Christopher Wray. Both were slated to testify today about the nation's threats, but like they did yesterday in the House, the men skipped the Senate hearing, claiming it needed to be classified. Committee Chair Senator Peters criticized the move, writing, quote, Americans deserve transparent, public answers about the threats we face, adding their refusal will, quote, only increase the concerns that many Americans have about our nation's security and will deal a serious blow to trust in our government. Faith-based nonprofits work to help prisoners across the country. Coming up, concerns those very same groups are facing discrimination. Download the CBN News app 24-7 News from a Christian perspective at home or on the road. One place for all of your news. Breaking news alerts, 
Set daily prayer goals and pray for news stories. Read the most important news and watch CBN News Channel Live. CBN News, because truth matters. Go to CBNNewsApp.com to get the app today. Welcome back. There's a Senate bipartisan effort to address the Federal Bureau of Prisons for discriminating against faith-based nonprofits. And two senators are crossing the aisle to get answers on practices happening under the First Step Act. CBN Capitol Hill correspondent Michelle London gives us a breakdown. Well, Jenna, tonight, Republican Senator James Langford says he and his Democratic colleague, Gary Peters, will continue to push federal prison leaders until proper changes are made. I think Jesus lives in prison because it seems like so many people meet him while they're there. Great. Uh, I would tell you that the love of God pours out to individuals regardless of their past. Senator Langford believes the incarcerated can also discover God's love and transformative power when offered faith-based programs approved under the First Step Act. Tested and proven around the country, he's witnessed how they can drastically reduce the number of repeat offenders. I talked to a young man that was in a program in a state prison, uh, that he had a faith-based experience that was there. It's been dramatic for him and the turnaround in his life. He is now a person that's actually leading and is actually mentoring young people in that. Langford says we should be hearing more of these success stories, but that hasn't been the case. Well, the Bureau of Prisons has failed to actually act on that. They're not allowing these different faith-based entities to actually get into the uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons and to actually do these programs. To change that, Langford recently teamed up with Homeland Security Chairman Gary Peters. They wrote Bureau of Prisons Director Colette Peters, calling out discriminatory practices, citing how the implementation of recidivism reduction partnerships appears stagnant. The letter also pointing out that of the eight faith-based applications received, the Bureau denied five, only approved two, and left the other pending. She is the director there, and it is her responsibility to be able to make sure that there's equal opportunity provided. You should not have a situation where people of faith are literally blocked out of something, especially something as important as anti-recidivism. The programs fall under the First Step Act, signed into law in 2018 by then-President Trump. It requires the Bureau to help incarcerated people obtain a valid form of ID, like a driver's license or social security card and assist individuals applying for federal and state benefits. Plus, under the act, wardens are encouraged to enter into recidivism, reducing partnerships with faith-based organizations and other nonprofits. Now, six years later, Langford says the Bureau of Prisons has still not acted on FSA's requirement. We don't want people that are in prison to end up in prison over and over and over again. If they can have life change while they're in prison and they end up reconnecting with their family, get a job, actually get into society, that's better for everybody. And after I reached out to the Federal Bureau of Prisons about Senator Langford's concerns, a spokesperson replied that they only discuss matters directly with congressional members. Senator Langford says he's already planned a follow-up meeting to ask them for next steps. Jenna. All right, Michelle, thank you. The International Criminal Court targets the head of Israel. We explain when Faith Nation returns. Welcome back. A bombshell legal ruling today. The International Criminal Court issued arrest warrants for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and former Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. The court alleges the leaders committed war crimes and crimes against humanity by using starvation as a weapon against civilians in Gaza. Netanyahu's office blasted the accusations, issuing this statement, saying, Israel utterly rejects the false and absurd charges of the International Criminal Court and biased and discriminatory political body. The court also issued a warrant for top Hamas leader Mohammed Def, although he was reportedly killed in an Israeli strike. The ICC charged him with war crimes and crimes against humanity for orchestrating the October 7th attacks against Israel. Some Israeli victims of the attacks celebrated the news. Someone sees them, someone believes them. It's the prosecutor and his amazing investigation team who, with whom we've been in contact since October. Both Netanyahu and Gallant could face arrest if they travel to any of the 120 countries that are party to the ICC, including many areas of Europe and Latin America, as well as Canada and Australia. 
The United States is not under the court's jurisdiction and is not obligated to arrest anyone charged. Well, in Ukraine, Ukraine is claiming Russia deployed an intercontinental ballistic missile for the first time in its nearly three-year war. The overnight attack hit the city of Dnipro, injuring two people. While Kyiv says the strike was carried out with an ICPM, Russian President Vladimir Putin says the attack came through the use of a uh, medium-range ballistic missile. U.S. officials told the Associated Press that's the weapon they believed was used. Today, our crazy neighbor once again showed what he really is and how he despises dignity, freedom, and human life in general, and how afraid he is. He is so afraid that he uses new missiles, and he searches the world for other places to find weapons, in Iran, in North Korea. Today, there was a new Russian missile. All the characteristics, speed, altitude, of an intercontinental ballistic missile an investigation is currently underway. It is obvious that Putin is using Ukraine as a testing ground. International debate about what missile was used is continuing tonight. But since the Cold War era, Russia and the United States have given each other advance warning on ICBM launches as not to spark fears of a nuclear attack. Still ahead, a garage sale find is headed to auction. That's next on Faith Nation. Finally tonight, a rare discovery at a garage sale is a bit of a home run for one Massachusetts man. Yeah, it's all thanks to a decades-long baseball card collector. Jeff Gross was having a garage sale when a man arrived with a stack of old baseball cards. Gross helped the man sort through them and quickly realized he was handling a golden collection, one piece of memorabilia, a never-before-seen 1916 Babe Ruth rookie card could go for millions. The owner of the card, yeah, wants to stay anonymous. You know, someone said this morning, uh, does he know he won the lottery? He said he does now. And the card will be up for auction starting at $150,000, but is expected to go for way more. Did I understand that correctly? So he did not buy it off of the guy. The guy still has it, and he's going to auction it off. That's a good Samaritan. I would say. Yeah. Good for him. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for Faith Nation. Have a great night. We'll see you here tomorrow.